Rise and shine, my sinners. When Father Evil starts his day, he gets a little deadly. Deadly Grounds Coffee has the richest, smoothest flavor you'll find anywhere. It's sinfully delicious. Once you go deadly, you never go back. Order yours at getdeadly.com. Coffee's so good, it's scary. Hi, this is your host, Rigor, and you're listening to The East Meets the West with my co-host, Patsy the Angry Nerd, who has just celebrated the 250th episode of one of his podcasts, Throwdown Thursday. Are you still recovering from that, Pat? Yeah, that was a long show, and there was a, a, a lot of folks uh, coming on, and you know, we didn't have any specific schedule for like how long people were going to stay and when they were going to jump on, so we just kind of you know, played it by ear, and you know, we uh, had a good time. You know, I thought you were uh, cosplaying as as Billy Idol for a moment, just because of the the <laughs> lighting and uh, your headphones looked like uh, long dangly earrings. Right. <laughs> oh man, how long did it go to? Um, we did about three hours, so about ten thirty. Wow. Uh, and then we kind of hung around for a little while longer after that, till about eleven thirty. Oh my! Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it was a long. Yeah, I was glad you guys invited me on. Yeah. We... Oh, sorry. Go I would say it was a long show, but yeah, of course. You know, it was. Um, you know, you and I do this show together, and you know, I have nothing but respect for you. So I want, I wanted to uh, have you be a part of the, you know, the big episode. And you know, like I said, we cast a wide net. We asked a bunch of people to come on, and you know, some people weren't able yeah. to make it. Some people were. You know, we we're asking people from you know different countries and time zones and. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with how the episode turned out. Nice. Yeah, it was awesome. I, I felt bad because for some reason my Wi-Fi was so shitty. You guys would, like, turn into the, the swirly loading pictures for a while. And so I, I would just sort of sit there and smile and wait for it to come back so, <laughs> I, so I didn't look like a dork. And But I, I did one thing stupid my wife pointed out afterwards. I didn't realize that, like, I was doing the whole Brady Bunch thing because, you know, the squares at the beginning of the Brady Bunch and they're all looking at each other? Yeah. I was doing that thinking the configuration was the same for everybody. And my wife afterwards was like, you nitwit, you nitwit, it's different. You know, the blocks are all different for everybody. So my, I guess my joke didn't really work that well. I mean, like, usually if you can if you can get it just right, and I don't know what the settings are, but if you can get it just right, you can get it so everybody's seeing the same thing. Like, you can rearrange stuff, but I don't know how to do that, so I didn't. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. So, oh, actually, one last thing I wanted to say. So, I was thinking when we here at uh, the, uh, the East meets the West, when we get to our 250th episode, I was thinking we could have Bob Eubanks on, who I had on on then as now. He could do some cattle roping. Then we could drink tons of whiskey, eat tons of lo mein, and then maybe have a couple of lynchings. What do you think? Um, you know, up until the last part, you know, I'm I'm with you. The whiskey <laughs> and the lo mein, I'm I'm good with. <laughs> you know, I'm always down for whiskey and lo mein. <laughs> Absolutely. Who isn't? <laughs> All right. So today we are finally breaking into the 1980s with the Shaw Brothers film Shaolin Hell Hellgate, a.k.a. Heaven and Hell from, you guessed it, 1980. And then we're going to cover They Call Me Trinity from 1970, which is one of those movies that because of the sequel's type of title, I always get it wrong, but I'm pretty sure I get it right here. It's They Call Me Trinity. Uh, but first up, we're going to talk about Shaolin Hellgate.
I wanted to read this from a review of Shaolin Hellgate from a website called City on Fire, which is about Asian cinema. And what they said basically was, if you don't think drugs have done good things for us, then do me a favor. Go home tonight and take all of your VHS tapes and DVDs and burn them, because all those Hong Kong directors who made all those great movies that enhanced your lives throughout the years, they were real fucking high on drugs. Chang Che was so high, he directed a movie called Heaven and Hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, I got very much like trippy David Lynch uh, vibes from this. And it's weird. Like, it's got a 6.2 on uh, IMDb, but only 124 reviews, which is crazy uh, when you consider that They Call Me Trinity has a 7.5 out of 10 uh, with 20,189 reviews. So wow. it's got... 20,000 more reviews than, than <laughs> Shaolin Hellgate. Well, I, I think, though, too, Shaolin Hellgate was, first of all, hard to find, and I don't think it was released here. If it was, it was very, very limited, like one or two theaters. I felt like it was it was as if the movie Star Crash and the movie Xanadu had a love child, and the, the child had a fever dream about the Venom mob. This this movie was that dream. Yeah, this was this was definitely like like what dreams may come... Combined with like the yeah. Matrix, like <laughs> combined with God of War, like it was just it was so weird. Yeah. So let me uh, give the synopsis here, which I actually had to pull it from like three different places because there's no one real good synopsis, and IMDb's is just like two sentences. So we start off in heaven, where the angel named Zhu Bao saves royal maid Zhi Zhao from a whipping, and together they flee to the mortal world. Now, gatekeeper Jin Ling aids them in their escape and is confronted by Heaven's top-tier soldiers, led by Chiang Shang and his magic ring. And those guys are dressed as oversized poodles, so I'm going to call them the Poodle Guards. Jin is published, I'm sorry, Jin is punished by being banished to dwell in the mortal world of Earth, and we never see the couple again. Once on Earth, Jin Ling is reincarnated as a simple taxi driver, but his kind-hearted nature sees him come to the aid of another couple. Chen Ding and Shi Qi are doting teens who first sing a sappy love song in front of a fountain that spews packing peanuts instead of water. And their only obstacle to happiness is a drug lord named Mr. Huo, who wants Shi Shi for himself. The couple jump into Xin Ling's cab to flee when a carload of thugs stops them, and in the ensuing fight, misfortune strikes when Xin Ling, Xin Ling himself is shot dead defending them. His murdered soul has nowhere to go but straight to hell, and like the previous couple, we never see them again either. Now, once in the underworld, Xin Ling befriends a sad girl named Hang Chin, or Red Dress, who was sent to hell for getting high and jumping out of a window. Traditional Buddhist texts describe 134 levels to hell from the Tang Dynasty forward. Hell is comprised of 18 levels, or as Wang Chi would put it more simply, Chinese got a lot of hells, Jack. The two decide to skip judgment in the palace of hell, but are soon separated, and Ji, Lung, Ji Ling finds himself condemned to the gambling hell, by the judge of hell himself. Swiftly making his escape, the two are soon reunited, falling in with a gang of bandits before being estranged again. Xin Ling is sentenced to the plow hell, where Ch while Chin is snatched by hell's brothel madam Yen, but just when things look hopeless, whispers arise amongst the city of lost souls that the Buddha of mercy is due for his annual pilgrimage, and his reward is reincarnation for the most worthy souls. The Buddha of mercy makes his yearly visit to the city, and he singles out Jin Ling and tells him to recruit four other honest wrongdoers, as opposed to evildoers, who are wrong souls whose help he counts on to fight their way out of the underworld. Zin tests each soul by cutting them to see if they bleed red instead of black. Once he determines that he's found the right four, we realize that the Venoms are back. Now, we're told their own brief backstories. Lo Meng's a street youth, <laughs> no, no surprise there, who was shot dead by a gangster. Philip Kwok was a soldier killed by a corrupt official who was once his brother-in-arms. Bruce Tong is wronged and tortured by similar corruption. And Sun Chen was the victim of a robbery gone bad. And in that scene, look out for Kara Hui in a cameo as his girlfriend. Now, once they're all located, the remainder of the film more or less descends into one long martial arts brawl between Lee and his team and a legion of hell guards who just happen to be the spiritual forms of their mortal enemies. While this movie sometimes can almost get tedious, the action, the amazing sets, the monsters, the overall color scheme seem to work in a way that I figure it probably shouldn't, but it did.
And it also, I want to add that it reminded me of a Mexican wrestling movie, which I love Mexican wrestling movies. So, yeah, it was. So, Pat, first impression. I mean, you kind of said it, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it was bizarre. It was, it was so weird, and like, it was definitely out of place. And I wholeheartedly agree that there were lots of drugs that were consumed uh, during the making of this film. <laughs> the singing was just out of place. Uh, the set pieces were <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. Like the scene where he's trying to escape and there's like a gate and he climbs over the gate, but like, there's just like the gate and the two <laughs> pillars. You could just go around it. Like, I don't, right. I don't, I, I mean, I guess it's supposed to be some weird representation. And then the, the, the fountain and, them singing to each other and oh yeah like <sighs> and i don't think the song was, was the song translated for you in the version oh, it was not oh, okay it was basically this sappy love song she's all singing about his muscles and how manly he is and he's singing about how cute she is and how much they love each other it was oh it was awful <laughs> i mean that makes sense you know um yeah it it uh, it was a weird it was a weird uh experience watching this and the first time I watched it, it was only 25 minutes long. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Like, this is, you know, how long can <laughs> this bad. drug-fueled rampage go on? <laughs> but I was like, all right, this can't be right because it just cuts off in the middle of a scene. But, yeah, I, I didn't watch the yeah, trailer. I apologize I didn't... for that. No, no, it's not a big deal. I didn't watch the trailer. I didn't look at the, you know, the IMDb, you know, as, as you know, is my tradition with right. this. All I did was, uh, you know, throw it on and see what, what happened and... I mean, there were some good fight scenes, obviously. There were some, uh, you know, like, it was weird, though. Like, the beginning fight scenes when they had, uh, when they, they're trying to escape heaven, which I don't understand why you, if you're in heaven, you'd be punished for dropping something and <laughs> with 300 lashes. Like, I mean, it's heaven. Shouldn't nothing break? And, like, you're going to get whipped 300 times? Like, that's <laughs> insanity. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, whatever. Everybody's version of heaven is different, but like that wouldn't be mine. And then you have the the lead guy there. He kept like hitting guys in the neck with his weapon, but like nothing happened. Like it was weird. Right. Like he kept like it's like oh I win. It's like ah no you don't win. I did like seeing some of the backstories of uh, of the venoms and like why they were in hell. Like again. You know, yeah. this is a weird religion. It's like, oh, you were trying to protect someone and you got killed. Rup, right to hell with you. Like, wait, what? <laughs> right. <laughs> you got stabbed protecting you. Like, I must have blinked and missed, but who shot him with arrows while he was defending his girlfriend? <laughs> like, I know. That... Oh, and they weren't even arrows. They were, they were like fondue sticks. <laughs> oh, like, because I, I must have looked away for something. I'm like... When the hell did an archer show up? Like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, I think he, like, turned to his car and, and pulled them out and then whipped them at uh, uh, Sun Chen. Yeah, because that was weird. I'm kind of surprised, and you can tell that this is a different time, that, you know, yeah, you, you see the scene when the, uh, oh, and I'm losing his, his name, but uh, he gets shot right through the NFL logo on his shirt. And it's like, first <laughs> of all, you were able to have the NFL logo in your film. Like if you tried that shit today, oh, yeah. like you're you're uh, you're out of luck. Uh, I will also that was Lo Ming, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I will also say that the makeup job of the scary guys, the demons there. I mean, I don't know if it was last second or they were trying to save money, but you know, it certainly looked like one of those two things. <laughs> well, there's a lot that goes into this film uh, in terms of the making of it, and um, we'll, we'll get back to the cast in a little bit. I'd like to talk about them. But it, it had a troubled production history. It started. They started filming it in 1975, and the shooting title was called The Hell. But then uh, I guess the funding dried up, so the project was shelved, and then uh, they resumed back in 77, and But at that point, the principal cast members, David Chang, Maggie Lee, and Shi Tzu, whose um, Shaw had, contract had expired, were no longer available. So Chang Che drafted um, a bunch of guys that he had in um, his movie Chinatown Kid, got them into that, and then, the, um, then he got the Venom Mob in. And they completed it in 79. And, uh, f you know, filling out the footage with the backstories of them and all that, all that stuff. And then they finally released it in early 1980. Um, I guess, though, it was not 
a, a, a nightmare for the editor that somehow he was able to put it all together fairly easily, even though it's like this fucking fever dream thing. But the big thing about it was that it's billed as an Alexander Fu Shang film. Now, he was the guy, the second couple that were on Earth that got killed at the taxi cab. Or, or no, I'm sorry, he didn't get killed at the taxi cab, but he got away. But people went in thinking it was an Alexander Fu Shang movie, and it's actually uh, Lee Yin Min who ended up becoming the main character, and he's the guy that played Zin from, from Heaven. He is in all three segments, er, uh, Heaven, Earth, and Hell. So it's interesting that they still were able to kind of pull this movie off. Yeah, it was uh it was definitely a massive undertaking and I'm astonished that the uh editor was able to do this fairly simply. Maybe he was on a bunch of drugs too and he didn't you know, he wasn't quite sure. I'm like, Hey man, I cut this all together for you. It's totally good and then they were like, Holy shit it is like, no <laughs> we didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah, it it's uh it's definitely a trip and a half, like the opening scene is just like, what is going on here? Like, am I watching like a Yodorowsky film? Like, what's going on? Like, what what are we doing here? <laughs> like, it's it's absolutely bonkers. I mean, they get the you know the really good fight scenes, and I kind of liked the different um, torments and hell that they were showing. Um, yeah, oh, the flaying alive, being boiled alive, mm. uh, the gossip ladies having their tongues pulled. Yep, so many good ones. You know, guys getting <laughs> impaled and. Like it, it was, it was nuts. I mean, I thought it was pretty good. Like it's, I don't know. I, I don't think it's my favorite of the Venom films by any stretch. But it's, no. uh, it's definitely, it's definitely a movie that I watched. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. I have to say, the first time I watched, I actually had to watch it twice. Well, I usually do anyways for these films because the first time I'll watch it, and the second time I'll take notes. But so the first time I watched it, I got the plot completely wrong. I thought that the couple on Earth was the same as the ones that were in heaven because they kind of looked the same to me. And so I thought when when Zin, when Jin went to hell and he was supposed to gather the Venoms as a team, I thought they were going to fight their way out of hell and go back to Earth and rescue the couple. And that didn't even happen. It like it just they walked out. They had like some swirly 70s stuff, had 70s clothes, and then it was the end. And I was like, well, wait a minute. What about rescuing the couple? And then when I found the synopses online... They weren't even the same couple. They were just completely unrelated. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I was all confused. You you see it and you're like, okay, yeah, like that's a natural thing. But yeah, <laughs> there's so much going on, and like, it's not being clever for being clever's sake. It's not like like oh, we tricked you. You thought this was happening. It was here's a bunch of stuff, and we're putting it all together, and. It's like, oh, I right. bet you couldn't make this movie. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a wager to me. And then he made this <laughs> wacky-ass movie. <laughs> now, I don't have any other titles, but this is not uh, uh, just a one-off. Um, this is considered, it's sort of a subgenre called Fantasia, F-A-N-T-Asia. And a Fantasia film combines fantasy, kung fu, wuxia, which is the um, you know the, the period piece kung fu that we've been watching, Musical theater, gangster noir, sci-fi, love story, and pantomime. So it's basically anything goes. And where the pantomime fits in is that the um, the set where the two people are singing to each other, the couple. That's apparently that's a typical British pantomime stage. So that's why it's a little wacky with the popcorn peanuts, uh, uh, packing peanuts instead of uh, water. Well, I mean, that was honestly like the least of like the weirdness, like because they're sitting there <laughs> singing that stupid song. And it's like, where's the kicking? Like, <laughs> this is... <laughs> right. I mean, the... And did you notice there were no sound effects in that fight? Yeah, it, I thought that was weird, too. I'm like, well, you know, it's hell, so they don't get all their cool sound effects. Like, that's just... Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. It's a strange, strange movie. It's like, keep your weird heaven and hell fantasies out of my... Out of my, you know, <laughs> straightforward kung fu stories. <laughs> like, because we didn't get, like, I didn't care about the main characters, like, at all. Like, they weren't, right. they weren't charismatic. They weren't fun. You know, like, most of the time we watch these Venom films because the Venoms are fun. Like, they play off each other. Like, they're interesting. Like, they're good characters. This one, it was just like, I don't, I don't care. Like... 
Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, it's a Venom film. And it's like, it kind of reminds me of Godzilla 2014, where it's like, you don't get to see any real Godzilla action until like the last 20 minutes of the movie. I know. When the Venoms finally showed up, I was like, yay, thank God. Cause, and the reason I, I knew it was a Venoms movie, I had to make sure. I mean, not only is it on the list on Wikipedia, but um, I bought the DVD and on the cover it says, guest starring the Venoms. <laughs> Which, if you noticed, their names didn't show up till the beginning of the hell segment in the credits. Yeah. Otherwise, like, like that's the only thing that made this movie watchable to me. Like, this was like on par with uh, Life Gamble. Like, it was just yeah. You know, I'm fine with my action films having a thin excuse for a plot, but this. Like, like I said, I just didn't care about the characters. Like, I didn't care about the main guys. Right. You know, it's like, okay, he's saving her from heaven because she was about to be tortured? Like, <laughs> you know, give me something where they're accidentally sent to hell, you know, for no reason. And, like, all these good guys are sent to hell for no reason. Like, I get right. why a couple of them were, were sent down there. It's like, oh, we're going to run around, start fights, and, you know, get murdered. You know, because we're a bunch of jerks. Yeah, that's fine. You know, you deserve that. <laughs> it's like, oh, you were double-crossed by your brother, and he stabbed you because you wouldn't kill him. Ha! That'll teach you. Go to hell. Wait, right. why? <laughs> what did I do? Well, you should have been smarter. Like, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's it's considered, um, a lot of people consider this one of Chang Che's worst films. Mm -hmm. That's fair. And, you know... I think it's a little more interesting and engaging than you expect. I think going into it, you and I both expected it to be a standard martial arts film like we've seen, just, you know, with a variation. We didn't expect to get a, a, fan, a full-on Fantasia film. And one thing I think that hinders our Western people viewing of the film, you had mentioned earlier about, well, in heaven, this shouldn't happen, or at least in my heaven. And that's the thing, is this thing sort of explores the Chinese versions of heaven and hell, which may not necessarily make a lot of sense to us or may not be how we, you know, with our Christian ideology of fire and brimstone, it's a little more straightforward. And, you know, in, in the Chinese hell, I guess the souls that commit mortal sins are assigned various trials and tortures and tests until they've atoned for it. And then they're, re they're judged redeemed and the souls allowed to go back to earth reincarnated. I mean, again, so I mean, that's... that makes sense, and I and I understand that. You know, it's just that, you know, I get, you know, the everyone's vision of hell is going to be different. You know, to, even, you know, two people in the same religion are going to view hell differently because, you know, it's, it's subjective. Right. It's like your worst fears and your worst tortures, and, you know, you're atoning for the things that you've done. But, you know, every from what I understand, everybody's version of heaven is supposed to be this, you know, utopic paradise where everything is wonderful. Right. And it's like, oh, you broke a vase, and now we're going to whip the shit out of you because you broke a vase. But it's like, how could you... And, like, it seems like there's some sort of subservience, and, like, it's like, oh, will you serve me because I'm the master of, of this domain? So, you know, it's almost like, you know, a, a an afterlife version of you know, feudal Japan, you know, it's, it's so weird. Right. <laughs> like, that's the only part that to me, you know, like I get that it's a, a totally different, you know, religion and it's not, you know, specifically made for, you know, American audiences or Christian audiences. It's just, I didn't understand why that was the driving force of the plot was we have to escape heaven so we don't get tortured. Like that, right. that was my, my main issue with the uh with the plot there well the worst is getting tortured for for dropping a comically large peach i mean really that 300 lashes yeah it's like <laughs> first of all why would it break you know second of all like you don't have another one it's heaven like right. <laughs> you know yeah, they were they were definitely very inconsistent with the magic powers and like weapons would appear and disappear from guys hands people would appear and disappear it was just like they were on fucking drugs and just was what we were like whatever. Okay. I'll be honest though. Now he's got an axe. Okay, now he's got a spear. Watching the uh, the fight with the golden ring like that was kind of cool. Like you you know again a new weapon that we haven't seen. You know. Yeah. And I thought that was pretty cool. And the way it expanded and contracted that was mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I liked that a lot. Like I thought it was pretty good.
That's one thing I was a little disappointed was Chang Shang uh, didn't get a whole heck of a lot of screen time, and he was, you know, forced to wear that stupid poodle-looking costume. Uh, it was too bad. <laughs> yeah, very unfortunate. <laughs> so I wanted to get into the cast here. Well, first, of course, this was directed by Chang Che, who's directed all of the movies we've watched so far. Also written by him and co-written by Ni Kuang and Chu Lang. Uh, its alternate titles were Heaven and Hell and Heaven and Hell Gate. So, once again, there's no Shaolin in the film. It's just a marketing tag, I guess, to get people to like it. And um, one thing to note, it was, at least for for me, it was released on January 19th, 1980, which would have been two days after my 10th birthday. And I actually wish I had seen this as a kid. If I had seen this in the movie, I wouldn't have gotten it, but I would have enjoyed it, uh, even, even if I didn't know who the Venoms were. Because uh, I just love movies that are batshit crazy. I always have. I mean, I watched it, and I didn't quite get it. So, I mean... Yeah, <laughs> and I, I and I don't think that's a failing on my part. I think that's because the plot was so all over the place. Right. It's like they tried to cram like six or seven ideas into this one thing. Oh yeah. Oh, then it's like like the first fight is like um something out of West Side Story, where they're not really hitting and then they're, they're more like dancing. You know the whole the whole beginning there with, with, on Earth looked like a play. Yes. Yeah. It was it was so, weird. But I, I guess. I guess that's, you know, just par for the course for these kind of movies. Then we have, uh, in the cast, we have uh, David Chang, who played Zhu Bao. He was the guy from the first couple in heaven. And he was in 148 films, including The One-Armed Swordsman, which uh, I think that's a uh, Shaw Brothers film we're going to have to get to. And then, of course, Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires was the Shaw Brothers and Hammer Films teaming up. So we are going to cover that one day also. Um, but apparently this was the last film in which he worked with Chang Che. Gotcha. And then, of course, he didn't do too much. You know, the first couple, we had Maggie Lee, or Maggie Lee Lin Lin, who played the, the chick in the first couple. Then we've got the the main character, basically, in the movie, who was second build, but he's uh, he ends up being the main character through the whole film, um, Li Yi Min. And he played the, the Heaven's Chief Guard, Zin Ling, uh, slash the taxi driver on Earth. Uh, you may recall he was Master Nan in the light, in the movie Life Gamble, which there are a lot of Life Gamble connections to this movie. Yeah, like how they're both awful. You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that's one connection. And most of the actors, most of the actors were in both, but in none of the other Venom films. So yeah, it's it it was not my not my favorite by a long shot. No, I agree with that. Um, Alexander Fusheng. Was um, he played Chen Ding, who was the guy from the second couple, the couple on Earth. He also was in Life Gamble, and like I mentioned before, people went to, to this movie thinking it was an Alexander Fusheng vehicle because he was billed as the star. And his real life wife uh, Jenny Sang, she played his his girlfriend there, Shi Shi, and uh, they've I think they're on screen for like less than fifteen minutes, and then. Um, you know, we talked about him a little bit in Life Gamble because uh, you may remember he was the dude that uh, in a later film he was hanging from a wire and it, the wire broke and he fell on his head. And then in another movie he shattered um, all the bones in his right leg and then he died at age 29 in a car accident. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I remember. Yeah, that guy. Ooh, unfortunate. Yeah. I know, I know, and like I said, he was um, he was married to her, to Jenny Sang. Now, she has an interesting past here. She was born to an Austrian expatriate father and a Chinese mother in the uh, former P Portuguese colony of Macau, and, but then her parents got divorced, and the father got custody of her, and he remarried another Chinese woman who already had kids, and she sort of felt alienated in this situation. She ends up moving back in with her mother in Taiwan, where she, she just went by the name Jenny. And she became what's called a Mando Pop recording artist, which was uh, Mandarin music fused with sort of a jazz influence. And she went on to fame in Hong Kong eventually as a crossover Canto Pop um, person, which is, I guess, Cantonese music that's made similarly. And that allowed her to extend her versatility and um, even a little bit of international star appeal as a TV slash film celebrity. And, of course, like we said, she was married to Alexander Fusheng for seven years until he died at age 29. So, again, you know, someone hugely popular, but for whatever reason, because they lost the funding, these guys are only in it for, like, a few minutes. Which is unfortunate, you know, especially where, you know, you're a guy that, you know, gets all kinds of jacked up every time you you, you make a movie. You know, you kind of need the extra income that you never know. Right. 
Right. So just a couple others I just want to uh, mention here real quick. We had Chen Chi Lin. She played Red Dress. She was also in Life Gamble as Xiao Shang. And then, um, oh, uh, Johnny Wang Lung Wei was the hitman in this. He was the guy hired to take out the second couple. And um, he's listed as crime boss on the Hong Kong movie database. But he played Iron Robe from Kid with the Golden Arm. I thought he looked kind of familiar. Yeah. They were, are they all starting to look familiar to you? Like, not all, but a bunch of them? It, you definitely see some uh, repeat faces. Yeah, yeah. So then we've got our poodle guards, the Chang Shang as Nacha. Dick Wei, the pointy-nosed guy, he's Jin Cha. And then another guy, si Yu, Siu Yuk Lung, played Mu Cha. The guy who played the Buddha of Mercy was named Yui Wing. And he, didn't, he only made like 33 films, and this was his second-to-last movie. And then, of course, we've got our, our Venoms. We've got Philip Kwok, who played Chen Tian Yang. Lo Meng was Wei Han Ting. Sun Chen was Lin Wei Gang. And Bruce Tong, also known as Chan Chen, he played Yan Tin Zan. We saw him previously also in Life Gamble as Wu Hao. He might have been, if I remember correctly, the guy that had the knives that he had in holsters that he would flip like guns. Maybe. I think. I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, I would have to double check. And lastly, um, as I mentioned in the um, in the synopsis, we have Kara Hui, who played uh, Sun Chen's girlfriend. She is the inaugural and a three-time recipient of the Hong Kong Film Award for Best Actress. Uh, her portrayal of a mother in the 2009 film called At the End of Daybreak won her a bunch of acting awards. And on July 1st, 2018, she was awarded the Bronze Bahunia Star by the chief executive of Hong Kong Special Administration Re Region in recognition of her contribution to Hong Kong film industry and acting performances. So I guess her being in this is a huge deal, even though she's in it for like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if you can get a uh, a cameo by somebody who's, you know, so well respected, you know, it's kind of like the Stan Lee cameos of, uh, you know, all the Marvel films or the fact that Matt Damon was in uh, the uh, the third Thor film. Oh, yeah. Which I thought was hilarious. But I don't at the time, she, at the time she wasn't. Yeah, it was hilarious. At the time, though, she wasn't a star. She was still starting out. I mean, this is don't forget, this is 1980. And, you know, she won these awards in, in the 2000s. But yeah, it's, it is kind of funny, and it's also because of the um, the fact that their budget got cut, so, and these people had to move on, and they couldn't get them back. Would have been an interesting film if it if the couple stayed, you know, if they were able, if they kept the funding. I wonder what direction they would have gone it with it. Yeah, um, you know, with this film, I I think it would have been a waste just because it, there's so much nonsensical uh, direction, like <laughs> it, you know. What would it have? Would it have changed like anything as far as you know how the film was received or how you watched it? Probably not. Right. I I think though the sets were really cool. I did like the um the hell because I was watching it the first time through and I'm going, geez, what was the budget on this thing? Because the sets look great, but then you know as you find out, it was done over the course of several years. So I mean, that's probably how they did it makes sense. I mean, I think this is one of those things that would have to take quite some time to. You know, not only conceptualize, but convince other people that this is a project worth making. Because while Cheng Shea may have may have been on drugs, I don't think everyone was on drugs. So, in order to get people right. into your <laughs> drug fueled fever dream, you know, there's a fair amount of convincing that has to take place. Right. Did you notice too? I think there was the Heavenly Guards at the beginning. They had like pumpkin spears, like in um, who was it that had? Was it in Life Gamble again, where the dude had the the spear with like the pumpkin looking thing? Yeah, at there the were end? a couple of them, and it was weird. And I like the 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 weapon. I think it's kind of cool, but it's also like I, I don't. It, it seems so unwieldy. Like, how do you maintain like the the balance and the weight on something like that? Right. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's just, it's bizarre. <laughs> Especially if it really is metal. I mean, obviously it's a prop, so I'm thinking it's just going to smash open on somebody's head. But then if it's a real weapon, it would be so heavy on that end. It would, it, like you said, it's just unwieldy. Yeah, like it, it definitely would. I mean, I, although I suppose it, it's not that much different from wielding a war hammer, you know, because obviously that's. That's you true. know, all on all that all that weights on one end, you know, you'd probably use a similar type of fighting style for it. Right. 
One thing I, I'm always curious about, too, in these movies, or, like, something about Asian films, Chinese and Japanese movies, they got this weird thing about ridiculously long tongues or dudes on stilts with puppet arms. It's like the the bad guy's trying to talk, and he's he's talking like this because his tongue is hanging out of his yeah, mouth. Yeah, it's like I was like, what the hell is this guy doing? Is he eating fruit by the foot? Like, what's going on? Right. <laughs> I was thinking that too. Like, it's so weird. It's so weird. Why they would be doing that? It's just something about because I mean, if you've ever seen like drawings and stuff from ancient China and Japan, they've always got these people with like ridiculously long tongues. Yeah, I guess the puppet thing too is just kind of scary. Like at the very end, when they were all walking out of the portal, what was up with the one dude where the head pops off? <laughs> yeah, or like the really long neck. It's like what? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I it lost me at that point. It's like all right, so they're they're <laughs> they're going back and like so they're taking away. You know, honestly. This probably would have been better served as an animated film. Oh, maybe, yeah. Like, especially yeah. the transformations and everything at the end. Right, right, yeah. You could have done a lot more creatively without having to worry about budget, you know. Yeah, and the uh, you know the look of the the demons would have been much better. It kind of reminds me of uh, like the Planet of the Apes films because as as those movies went on, like the budget was smaller and smaller, so they couldn't afford like right. all the makeup for everybody. So it would be like Roddy McDowell would get like the best makeup, and then like if anybody else was going to be shown, like they'd get decent makeup, you know, but they wouldn't speak. And then like anybody who was an extra would just have like an ape mask, like <laughs> right, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're right. The um, the makeup jobs in this wasn't that good. But one thing I thought was good was, and it's too bad it had to be in this movie because I hope in another movie they do it, was we finally really got to see Sun Chan in action. You know, I mean, first of all, he was rocking that 70s outfit, and then he was kicking ass, literally, and I just thought it was great to finally see that. Yeah, I thought he was really good. You know, and then he'll jump when the when the... The Buddha of Mercy says, all right, you guys can go to Earth. They all jump down off of the, the ridge or whatever they were sitting on. He lands and then holds his foot up in the air because he can, you know, just do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because he's, he's that pliable. Right. But I thought it was interesting, too, though, that the if you think about it, the Venoms literally confronted their own demons. It was the, the people that were responsible for killing them, you know, became demons. So it was sort of a, a little... Um, not an analogy, but uh, what's the allegory. word I'm looking for? Where a metaphor, no. a me yeah, allegory or a metaphor, where they were quote unquote confronting their demons. I think they didn't really play that up, but that's what I kind of got out of that. Yeah, I mean, it made sense that they would be, you know, I mean, they kept pitching it as revenge, but like, I don't feel like it was revenge. I feel like it was more like conquering, conquering a, of death. Yeah. It's interesting too when they get like the taxi guy gets reincarnated. He still knows who he is. Yeah, everybody the, knows who they are, and they know who their enemies are, even with the uh, disguise. Right. <laughs> that was interesting. Did you notice though too, like um, in the fights, particularly in the in the big long twenty minute end fight, it's sort of a mix of kung fu and weaponry choreograph choreography with uh, some contemporary fighting, uh, uh, you know, slugfests going on, because. The four heroes lived in different time periods, so basically their martial arts were matched up with their respective time period, uh, the fighting styles, I should say, of their respective time periods. Makes sense. I mean, it's it's uh, it's definitely a, a new direction of the Venom films, and one that I was was not really pleased with. Right. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think this isn't for everybody. I think if you you, you want just a good, straightforward Venom's movie. Uh, you might want to avoid this one. But if you're looking for something batshit crazy, I'm always drawn to batshit crazy, I think, then, then you know, this is your cup of tea. But uh, there was a couple, one last thing I just want to mention. There were a couple of funny lines uh, in the end fight where one of the demons is listing off the characters. He's like, you know, oh, so-and-so and so-and-so and some guy whose name I don't remember are escaping. Yeah, that was that was kind of funny. But, like, the humor in this was uh, severely lacking. Right. <laughs> And then uh, Lu Feng, of course, goes, well, I was his sworn brother, but I killed him. So I guess now we're enemies. <laughs> yeah, it's I was not overly pleased with the direction of this film. But again, you know, I've said that several times, but we did yeah. get some quality fight scenes. We did. That's about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we got some tender. So those are your songs. final thoughts on the movie. Uh, final thoughts on the movie. Um, if you're a completionist, definitely, you know, 
watch this. Or if you just want to, like, get high and watch something interesting, I mean, this will this will do it. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I mean, other than that, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it's a weird one. And for a martial arts <laughs> film, there's a shocking lack of... I mean, it's not... Uh, no, I, that's not true. There's a lot of martial arts in it, but just not from where you're looking there's more singing than you would expect um right but uh other than that yeah i mean give it a watch i mean i i think this is one of the weaker ones we've we've seen uh i would probably put this below life gamble just because life gamble actually had a plot and like there was a story to it that you know was easily followed and there was no no romantic singing um, which, you know, if, if you're, if you're watching a musical and like, that's what's going on, <laughs> like I'm fine with, like it, it has a place just as, you know, like if I'm watching, you know, Mary Poppins, you know, I'm not looking for her to like be strolling down the street with the children, get mugged. And then she kicks the shit out of them and like breaks their necks, you know, like I'm not looking for that <laughs> in, 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 in my, in stuff that's like way out of place, you know? Oh man, yeah, that's so true. I think, I think we're, we're this is not the last. Um, it's the first, but it's not the last of this kind of film that we're going to encounter. I don't know what's in store for us for the rest of the Venom films. Obviously, I don't think this is necessarily a direction they're going in. I think they just changed it up just because. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with you know uh, applying your your creative spirit and you know trying something new. I mean, he got the movie made. You know, like right, yeah. <laughs> And he did a little bit of everything. You got a little bit of West Side Story in there. You got, you know, uh, you know some 70s music, some 70s groove going on there. Did you notice, by the way, it, the um, their song kind of gets shut off, and it's a, um, it's a riff from the song Shaft, the theme song. You know, Shaft. I, I kind of thought that. I was like, oh, that's, that sounds familiar. But, like, I was, you know, not overly uh, nauseous from the song. Yeah, no, I was just <laughs> meh, you know? Yeah. So, all right, yeah, I agree with your assessment. I think, again, if you're a completist, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, or, like I said before, if you're into batshit crazy, this is definitely falls in that category. Uh, not quite. Uh, there's a lot of other batshit crazy movies that I, I could recommend that are gory. This is a little bit gory. It's more horror, too. It's not really a kung fu film. It's more of a horror film, which Hammer has... I mean, Hammer. Shaw Brothers have done quite a few horror movies, which we will get to eventually. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I wouldn't even refer to the like. I wouldn't even think of this as like a horror movie. Like, I get, I get where you're coming from. Like, because there is definitely some, some blood and guts and some over the top violence. Like, hey, help me lose so I can get my fingers cut off. Like, wait, what? Like, and that guy did that twice, <laughs> right? Which just made me think, like, oh, this is his eternal torment. He has to ask people to cut his fingers off for all eternity. Right. So he doesn't gamble, and it just doesn't work. Yeah. And I don't know. There were a couple of guys in hell though that were funny, like. What was it like the real estate guy or the investment broker? Like, oh, what can he's I like, okay, so where now? can I invest? Yeah, do you have any tips for me? <laughs> like, send them to send them to plow hell. <laughs> and then the alcoholic is standing under the, the giant bottle of gin or whatever it was, just guzzling it down. He's like, oh, this is great. Yeah. Which that would almost be like heaven to him, you know, unless he like dies of liver cancer every other day or something. Or he just, you know, drowns in alcohol. Right. I don't know. It, it was weird. I give I I a little bit of um go ahead. No, you I go. I say people should definitely watch it, you know, especially if you like the Shaw brothers just to I think maybe appreciate the other movies all that much more. <laughs> That's true. It's like, man, I was kind of, you know, I was kind of tough on my criticism of these other movies, but after seeing this, you know, <laughs> I feel bad. What well, what if what if we made like West Side Story but we we set it in Dante's Inferno? Yeah, yeah, and oh, so weird. All right, well, that was uh, Shaolin Hellgate, a.k.a. Heaven and Hell. We are going to take a break here, and when we come back, we are going to discuss My Name is Trinity from the year of my birth, 1970. You young whippersnappers. <laughs> We come from the retro future. We want you to be nostalgic for what's to come. A new channel and distribution network for smart people with bad taste featuring content from Church of the Subgenius, Creature Features, Cinema, Insomnia, Sleazy P. Martini, and Guar, Troma, Corey Maccabee, 
horror, sci-fi, Saturday morning cartoons, midnight movies, and assorted trash we love. Add our channel, OSI 74, to your Roku player or visit OSI74.com. All systems go. Prepare for a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster, Monster Kid, Kid Radio. Radio. Here your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster, Monster Kid, Kid Radio. Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Classic Monsters. Modern Talk. And the head of Rondo Hatton. Only on Monster, Monster Kid Radio! Hey folks. I just wanted to take a minute here to tell you about the hosting service that we use at Haven Podcasts, podserve.fm. Podcast hosting has never been easier. They do all the work to get your podcast on Apple Podcasts and other major podcast networks. They help you navigate the podcasting world, whether you're brand new or have years of experience. Folks, I can't tell you how happy I am with their service. When I first started this podcast, I searched around intensely for the right hosting platform. I found PodServe and used their simple four-step process, and in a short amount of time, my podcasts were on the internet and available through all the major podcast networks. And their customer support is unreal. Every time I goof things up and make a mistake, like uh, posting the wrong show to the wrong feed, I email them, and I kid you not, within minutes I get a response and the problem is resolved. And they're the only podcasting host that actually helps you get listeners. Other podcast hosts stop at Podcast Upload and don't help promote your podcast. Well, PodServe makes sure your podcast is seen by thousands of people. The promotion is free, and they put you on PodParadise.com, which has over 5,000 visits a day from avid podcast listeners and is growing every day. Each day, Pod Paradise selects five podcasts to spotlight on their front page. Maybe yours could be there soon. PodServe's pricing is simple. Only 19 bucks a month. That's it. No tiered pricing platform, just one low fee. For 19 bucks a month, you get unlimited storage, unlimited podcasts, free podcast promotion, your podcasts on all platforms, detailed download analytics, one-on-one -on -one customer support. You pay month to month, and you can cancel at any time. And when you sign up, you get 14 days free. You don't even have to give them your credit card. I love their service so much, I put a reminder in my phone to add my credit card when the 14 days was almost up. I couldn't give them my 19 bucks fast enough. I'm telling you, I, I really didn't believe it until I actually signed up and saw my podcast on everything from iTunes to Stitcher and Spotify and more in a ridiculously short amount of time. So if you've got a podcast and you don't have a hosting platform, I highly recommend podserve.fm. Check them out. Hello, this is Rod Barnett. I'm the host of The Bloody Pit, the podcast that examines films from across the decades. On The Bloody Pit, we have several ongoing series of shows within the show focused on specific things in genre cinema that I and my co-hosts find fascinating. There's a long-running series focused on Italian maestro Antonio Margheriti's films from the 1960s all the way up through 1990. There's an on-again, off-again series focused on 1970s science fiction films. There's an in-depth look at the Western movies that William Castle made before he struck out on his own and became the horror auteur that we know and love. A look at the classic Coffin Joe films from Brazil. And our long-term project to look at every universal horror film made in the 1940s. That's a long project, people. It's going to take us a long time. Sprinkled in amongst those are various other episodes focused on other stranger areas of cinema, like uh, Lucio Fulci, Dario Argento, and even some obscure British crime films from time to time. 
So join me and my rotating crew of co-hosts as we examine the stranger side of cinema through an exploitation lens. Except when we don't? Yeah, you never really know exactly what to expect on The Bloody Pit. So join me for The Bloody Pit. They call me Trinity. Hey, Trinity. They say you got the fastest gun around. Is that what they say? What's going on here? quick on the draw, I see. But I bet you'll manage to mess things up on me. I don't know how, but I'm sure you'll do it. I suppose you got nothing to do with this, right? No. Who's got the time? I'm already busy doing that. With the restless gun I advise you to watch the deputy. He is very fast. You hear that, Mortimer? The major says the deputy is very fast. They offended the law. They said I was a son of a no. That is. How are we going to settle that? Are you going to handle it alone? Sweet dream. I just woke up. You take your share. Me, brother. Now I go to bed, or you got something else planned for tonight? Well, I really came for a drink. West I don't think so. So, the second film that we're uh, discussing today is uh, 1970s They Call Me Trinity. Uh, which is yet another Terrence Hill Bud Spencer vehicle. And uh, funnily enough, it is not uh, a, uh, a, a, a threequel to any of the films that we've watched. This is a, uh, the first in a two-film series, I believe. Yes. The sequel is called Trinity Is Still My Name, which, I mean, sort of makes sense, because why would you, why would you change your name? <laughs> but uh, this is a... Uh, an excellent film. I, I, I love this. But uh, let's get into the plot synopsis a little bit. Uh, Trinity is a lazy, ne'er-do-well gunfighter with unnaturally fast drawing ability and marksmanship. Uh, he is dragged by his horse on a nice little, uh, you know, like a litter, a litter is what they uh, would call it. You know, it's kind of just made these uh, straps and stuff. And he's like, almost like a gurney or a stretcher. And right. uh, he... Ends up in this town uh, or a way station. It's not really a town. There's only like you know a couple of buildings there, which is a uh, way station and a restaurant. Uh, he encounters a pair of bounty hunters with an injured Mexican prisoner. Uh, Trinity calmly takes a Mexican away from the two men, killing them before they can shoot him in the back. Uh, prior to that, though, he eats an entire like pan of beans and an entire loaf of bread. Like <laughs> he's he's been on the road for a while. Uh, so the pair uh, reach a small town where they witness a local sheriff, a big burly man, obviously Bud Spencer, with a similarly fast drawing ability, gunning down three men after they harass him for not allowing one of their criminal friends to be released. And so they're sitting like, yeah, you know, let our friend out or there's going to be trouble. And he's like, no, no, there's not. And not for me anyways. So it becomes apparent that Trinity and the man known as Bambino, uh, which is obviously is Italian for bro- uh, baby, or something something along those lines. Because uh, yeah. that's what they used to call uh, Babe Ruth, the Grand Bambino. Right. Uh, Trinity and the man Bambino are brothers. Uh, Bambino is merely posing as the new sheriff of the small town while he awaits the arrival of his gang from the penitentiary from which he escaped, following a run-in with the actual sheriff, 
who incidentally just took the same way as Bambino on his way to his new post. And he discusses that. He's like, yeah, there was a guy, he was following me, but he wasn't really following me. He was just happened to be going in the same direction, but I didn't know that, so I shot him, and I just took over his position. But uh, it turns out that the sheriff is not dead. Uh, Bambino is not happy to see his troublemaking brother, but the two form a temporary partnership to deal with uh, Major Harriman, who is attempting to run a group of pacifist Mormon farmers off their land with the intention of using their property to graze his own horses. The fact that these horses are valuable and unbranded explains Bambino's grudging willingness to work with his little brother, even though he considers Trinity to be a shiftless bum without ambition. Now, there's a great line you know, where the Mormons are like, oh, we, you know, we just want this little bit of land. And the, the major's like, you have 200,000 acres. <laughs> <laughs> like, how much do you need? It's like, where'd you get all these cows? Oh, God sent them. It's like, oh, I want this land for my horses. Oh, well, we, we'll share it. No, no, we won't. It's like, wow, this guy's a jerk. <laughs> uh, Trinity has, uh, however, it says that he, f- he fell in love with two Mormon sisters there are a couple of cute blondes that he helped out uh, earlier in the day. I don't know about falling in love with them, but uh, he's definitely like, hey, two cute blondes. <laughs> so he seems generally concerned with the Mormon settlers' welfare, so he eventually persuades Bambino and his henchmen, who finally show up, uh, to help with the pacifist Mormons, uh, to train the pacifist Mormons to fight, which is a hilarious scene. Uh, In the final battle, the Mormon leader finds uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible that there is a time for fighting, and the Mormons are unleashed against Major Harriman's goo. I don't know about unleashed, but but yeah, they use dirty fighting tricks that they just learned from, uh, you know, uh, Trinity and Bambino. Bambino is flabbergasted and infuriated to learn that Trinity has given the Major's horses to the Mormons, because they're very, very valuable and there were supposed to be 20 that he was uh, going to try and steal because he's a crook. Uh, Trinity is about to be happily married to the two Mormon sisters when he learns that being married means actually having to work, causing them to run off after Bambino, who angrily sends him off in the opposite direction. He goes, well, I'm going to California, which means you're going east. Uh, after Bambino departs for California, the real sheriff appears, and Trinity like, oh, yeah, I saw those guys. They just robbed me, and they were going to take my boots, but they saw you coming. They went that way. <laughs> and so Trinity lays back down in his little uh, his little uh, gurney there and uh, follows everybody off into the distance. That was such a dick move. <laughs> oh, it really was, but he had to catch up with them somehow. Right. <laughs> I, I, I uh, love it, this it movie. It was weird. Oh, it was so good. Yeah. There there was yeah, so much uh, to I, love about it. Go ahead. I was going to say I definitely see where it uh the 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 thematic relation, you know, with all the religious stuff to uh you know, Shaolin Hellgate. Oh yeah. Jeez, I didn't even think of that. Oh, I thought you did it on purpose. No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, man, with the with the Shaolin um, with the um Shaw Brothers movies, it's, we just go in an order of release order now. And well, with these, all of these has happened to be doing some connection. Yeah, and we just happen to be doing turns. That's the thing. That's the great thing about the show is we're finding the, the the parallels between the spaghetti westerns and the the Star Brothers movies. Yeah, it's um, and it just happens to be lining up like every single time. Yeah, with the exception of what was it? There was Life Gamble, and then there was, um, oh, there was the gambling one. I think it yeah, was yeah. Ace High. Ace High. Ace High, yeah, that sounds right. We could have paired those up if we had known ahead of time. I mean, I'm kind of like you. I don't really, truly know what these movies are about before we watch them. I may, in the last few films, have had to check with the Shaw Brothers just to make sure the Venoms were in it because we had that one incident where it was the wrong movie. But Yeah, the, the Daredevil one. Yeah. Which wasn't actually the right movie. Right. <laughs> Like you, you're like, oh, this one has the venoms in it. But like, when we went to watch it, the movie that they were showing, it's almost like we went to go see like Terminator Two, but instead they screened like RoboCop. Right. (laughs) It's like I even paid for it too. I paid my three bucks on Amazon. I was like, what the fuck? This is not the right movie. (laughs) 
Yeah, what kind of bullshit is this? <laughs> but I got to say, there's just so much to love about this movie, and it, it's my new favorite now. I think it's right up there with Pistol for Ringo, at least in my book. You know, every little thing. And like, you, you can't look away from this movie. You can't be like playing a game on your phone or reading the, the, the paper or whatever. You got to watch because every little detail in every scene, there's something there. There's eye movement, eye contact, there's dialogue that's muttered here and there, there's background dialogue. And every single scene is packed with hilarious stuff. But it's not a, it's a comedy, but it's not a slapstick comedy. I think the comedy comes out of the dialogue. And the characters' reactions to things. Would you agree? That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a good uh, a good um, good assessment of it. This one for me, yeah, like it's one of the better ones. It definitely lets uh, Bud Spencer really show off his you know I'm a big tough guy persona, but also like gives him you know the the scene at the beginning when he 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 shoots and kills the three uh, the three guys that are uh, harassing him and you get to see like, Oh, he's also got some uh, quick draw skills as well. It's not just, you know, he's this huge guy that nobody can beat up, you know, because he's such an imposing physical presence, but he's also got, you know, some other skills as well. So that was kind of nice. Although of course they had the obligatory, you know, nine against two fight where he fights <laughs> eight guys and, and Terrence Hill fights one. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, come on, there's only nine of them. <laughs> yeah, he says, you want me to join? He's like, well, I just woke up, so you better take your fair share. And apparently his fair share is one. Right. <laughs> but in that Ugh. scene where where um, Bud Spencer's going up against those three guys at the very beginning, uh, even Trinity says to the drunken Mexican, he's like, you watch. He's like, those guys aren't even going to get their guns out of their hostess before they hit the ground. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it's speed. Speed is speed, man. Yeah. So one quick aside I wanted to mention, because um, you were talking about the gurney that he was being dragged on, which, first of all, how does the horse know where to go? I think the horse was like Comet I, on Briscoe County. I think it was just, well, the horse is just going to go, and when the horse stopped, he'd get up. Like, right. I don't think he had a, a real destination. Well, at the end, he told it to go to California. I, suppose... I think he just pointed him, pointed him west. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like... <laughs> It's like, here, go until you're tired. It, the, the thing he's being dragged on, uh, the, the Indian, I forgot what the word you said was, um, but there's an Indian term for it. What is it? Litter. A litter. Because the Indian term for it is a, a travoy. Yes. So that's that I Yeah, saw. I didn't say that because I was never sure how to pronounce it because I was going to pronounce it the French way. Oh, yeah. So I just used a different word. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's an Indian thing with a French name. But um, yeah, and the thing, the scene with him eating the beans, actually, so this kind of a, a, a spaghetti western, where it being a comedy, uh, it's a sort of a subgenre of the subgenre of spaghetti western, and it's they they're called fagioli westerns because of the beans that he eats in this, because this movie really kind of changed things for spaghetti westerns and said it was okay to make them be funny as well as being entertaining. And uh, so, mm -hmm. so, yeah, fagioli westerns are, uh, because that means beans, of course, in, in Italian. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I, I I don't know. I like uh, I like that scene at the beginning where it's like, oh, you know, for if you have money, I have beans. And he, like, brought them over and he, like, scooped a bowl, you know, some onto his bowl. Yeah. And he just kind of looks at the guy and he gives him a second scoop and he goes to walk away. He's like, ah, just leave it. And he pours all of the beans back in and he just like demolishes the entire like huge skillet like this isn't a normal skillet like this would take right. two burners on a regular stove like this thing is massive and it's steaming and it's just oh like i like beans but i don't think i could eat what looked to be i don't know two pounds of beans and wash it down with an entire bottle of tequila and a loaf of bread right <laughs> And that bread's got to be like sixty percent sawdust because they're in the middle of the desert, right? Like it, they're. Ugh. <laughs> but hey, it worked for him, 
Hey, that's all that matters. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they set it up well, too, because when he sa- tells the guys that his name is Trinity, all of a sudden they're shaking, and they're like, ooh, the right hand of the devil. So he just takes the Mexican guy that they've got there. I, I don't know if there was a bounty on that guy or they were going to take him. I think they were trying to take him in for a bounty, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so he just basically takes the Mexican guy, goes outside, and the two bad guys open the window to shoot at him, and he doesn't even look. He just shoots behind himself and gets them both. <laughs> he does that a lot. Like, there's that whole thing. It's like, oh, you know, you did this and did that, and one castration. <laughs> like, yeah. Because <laughs> he shot the guy right in the dick. Yeah. From, from, he, was, he, was, he was, yeah, he was sit- seated, and the guy was, like, on a balcony above him in a saloon, and he just shot him straight. Like, first of all, that bullet's not going to stop there. Right. Like. It's going to go up through his skull. Yeah, it's, but, again, it's part of that comedy you're talking about. Right. I guess the um, the, the fact that he could shoot people like that without even looking was inspired by a couple of comics, like, uh, I guess, newspaper strips. Uh, If you will, there was a Belgian cartoonist named Morris who wrote a comic called Lucky Luke, and he was, quote-unquote, the man who shoots faster than his shadow. And then there was another Italian comic strip called Coco Bill about a short-tempered but good-natured cowboy who helps sheriffs to capture capture criminals. So they said that that was a little bit of inspiration there for for Trinity, which was, I mean, he was just so cool in everything he did. Yeah, and, you know, if you've never read, um, and I think I've talked about this before, the uh, Dark Tower series um, by Stephen King, you know, starting with The Gunslinger, like, there's a lot of Sergio Leone, you know, man with no name type of of, uh, inspiration to this character. Yeah. But I think with, uh, you know, some of the other characters that you get to see along the way, like, there's definitely, like, some Lee Van Cleef and, you know, some Terrence Hill mixed into some of these other characters. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And Terrence Hill was so good in this. He just sort of had this wide-eyed, childlike look about him. Like, he, he didn't have a care in the world. And he was just, you know, wherever the wind blew him, that's where he ended up. But he was also kind of a nice guy. You know, he'd help out people if they looked like they were in trouble. So... And he was just cool. Like he, he wouldn't even sit on his horse properly. He like he'd sit on, what was it? He, he was sitting with his feet up on the horse's back in the end shot there when they were leaving. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean that's what he does. Like he's just, you know, it's like a nice, you know, I'm gonna be as relaxed and carefree as possible, and that's just the way the news goes. Like that's just how. How I'm going to be. I think his that really reflects on his character not wanting to be shot in the back. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> and it was funny because, you know, Bambino's always trying to get rid of him. And he's like, why can't you get a respectable job like a cattle rustler or a horse thief or something? And he's like, nah, I got too much. I'm too busy doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. So I thought this was interesting because the film, this even though they had done the the previous trilogy that we've already covered, this film really catapulted Spencer and Hill into international acclaim, and it's inspired apparently a shit ton of wannabe action flicks that were mostly lame, but we will eventually check some of them out. But it even instigated another European studio to make carbon copy films with guys who looked like Hill and Spencer. This is this guy Paul Smith and Michael Colby, and it was, uh, the first one that they did was a film called Caram- Carambola from 74. Hmm. And what's really funny, and this kind of goes back to when we did God Loves, uh, God Forgives But I Don't, um, the guy Paul Smith, he is the guy who looks like Bud Spencer, and he is actually the actor who played Bluto in the Robin Williams Popeye movie. And I think we, re- we mentioned that resemblance when we first talked about God Forgives. Yeah, you ref- you referenced that, and uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, thinking of, now thinking about that movie and thinking about thinking about Bud Spencer. Yeah, like there's a there's a striking resemblance between the two actors. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, big burly, burly guys. Oh yeah, you know, and it's funny because they had different guys that were gonna that they had originally in mind for this film. It wasn't originally Bud and I almost said Bud and Lou, uh, Bud and Terrence. <laughs> But um, Barboni first offered it to Franco Nero, and he didn't want to do it. And uh, I think Woody Strode was considered for the role. And this guy, Peter Martel, was supposed to play the character, but for whatever reason, he lost out to Terrence Hill again, which I think happened in God Forgives. He he had broken his foot, or he broke his toe, 
uh, when he found out his wife was cheating, or when the wife found out he was cheating on someone else, he kicked something and broke his toe. So Terrence Hill got that job. And then I forget the excuse here. I, or at least I couldn't find it online. But once again, he lost the, the role to Terrence Hill, who became an international star. And who remembers who Pete Martell is, you know? <laughs> yeah, like that's, there's a lot of those stories, you know. And you'd rather be on the uh, Terrence Hill side. Right. <laughs> but what's interesting about um, the director, let's talk about the director and the cast here. We've got uh, Enzio Barboni. He said he was trying to demystify the Italian Western. He's quoted as saying... As a director of photography, I had done many westerns, and one thing about them that made me laugh was their use of violence as an end in itself, which really irked me as a viewer. I believed that westerns ought to be amusing. There's something inherently comic about them, in part because they started off from the imitation of a world that we've, we've only dreamed about. It wasn't our world. We've, we've never even been there. We've never seen it. And then so I feel like, you know, we've seen a lot of these films now that were sort of, you know, Hollywood had been doing westerns since the beginning of film. And I think uh, the Spaghetti Westerns came along most prominently in 64 with uh, A Fistful of Dollars. But ever since then, you've had these directors that were trying to demystify it and, you know, just uh, deconstruct them. And I take... Originally, I was trying to figure out what that meant. I'm like, why are they doing it? You've just started this genre pretty much, you know, in 64. Now it's 70. Why are you trying to deconstruct it? And I think using that terminology, at least my opinion, and I'd like to know your opinion on this. My opinion is that they're just trying to make a movie in the genre, but try to do something that hadn't been done before rather than do the same old, same old. So it ends up coming across as deconstructing the genre. Does that make sense? Yes. I think, it. you know, anytime you can you know, um, kind of advance your genre and branch it off into, you know, a different type of subgenre, you know, you should take that opportunity. You know, like you know, you're saying with this film, you know, like injecting some comedy into a Western, which is normally like very serious. And, you know, I think that kind of gave birth to the buddy cop films of the 80s and 90s, you know, right. um, know where you're where you're gonna find you know uh you know cross pollination of genres like uh horror comedy and you know dramatic comedy like if, if you start mixing genres together like you're gonna start getting some like really cool results like you know mix you know a western film with space you know and you get star wars right you know or a samurai film i mean samurai films were westerns before westerns came out you know that's pretty much right <laughs> you know so you know you take the samurai western set it in space and you've got star wars yeah that's true yeah it's it's uh you know when you when you do that you you know you mix a couple of things together it's like i don't know if this is going to work sometimes it'll blow up in your face but a lot of times you know you come up with something maybe you don't do it that great but maybe somebody down the road comes up and says oh i'm going to do this and it's going to be awesome. Yeah. I mean, heck, somebody ought to mix West Side Story with Dante's Inferno and see what happens, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I was going to say with the last one, like, that was <laughs> not the best experiment. But, you know, he went for it. He did it. And, you know, this film exists. And, you know, I'm sure there are other films that have, you know, taken that route. Like, you know, again, What Dreams May Come by Richard Matheson, which would, I think was written around the same time. You know, you get a, a similar similar type of, you know, journey through hell. Right. Yeah. Oh, man. But this was, this was I thought, really well done. You know, of course, Trinity is quoted as being the right hand of the devil. And then um, he, he mentions that Bambino is the left hand of the devil, which I thought was cool. So the devil must be their mother, right? Well, who I is mean, sort of a running joke. Yeah, she's definitely a, a, a woman of ill repute, uh, yeah. according to them. But if you insult her, they'll they'll you know knock you on your ass for it. Yeah, I mean it's you know just because you know they say it doesn't mean you can say it. Right. Then we've got Farley Granger who played Major Harriman, and he's one of those actors that I've heard the name you know through my whole life. I've I don't think I've ever really well I have seen a couple of films he's in, not realizing who he was. But to me, doesn't that sound like he would be in westerns all the time if your name was Farley Granger? <laughs> yeah, it definitely sounds like a western name. You know, it's either that or you're like the guy that gets coffee. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was in Hitchcock's Rope and uh, Strangers on a Train, which those were the films I had seen him in. Um, he was also in 1981's The Prowler, and uh, then he did a lot of soap operas through the 
70s and 80s. One thing I thought was funny, especially in the end fight, when they've they've got him, they've got the gun on him through the through the wagon, the side of the wagon, and uh, they're talking to him. He sounded to me, his voice sounded just like Harvey Corman from Blazing Saddles. Hmm. It just it just really it was just uncanny how it just sounded like him the way, and I think his voice kind of got a little higher because he was worried about getting killed. Yeah, listening to him. I was like, this guy sounds like he did some sort of voiceover work or something because he's definitely got a very uh, unique, comedic, cartoony voice. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is, I did you notice they were all, for the most part, I didn't see anyone who wasn't speaking Italian. They looked like they were all speaking English. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, it, you know, it didn't seem like they were being dubbed over all that much either. Yeah. I think... Uh... I still think that they do. They did all the voice dubbing in post, but they just use their own voices, like we've seen in the past. Because I just pulled up a, I found an interview with Bud Spencer and um, Terrence Hill from the '80s. They were making an action movie here in in the U.S., and I posted it on the um, the East Meets the West Facebook page. If you guys listening get a chance to check it out, and it was really interesting. But they were speaking, but they had very slight Italian accents. So I wonder if when they did the voiceovers, they had a dialogue coach to get them to sound more like they were from the West, the Old West, you know. I think that's a, a, a quality uh, quality part to uh, spend your budget on. Like, that's definitely a good yeah. a good piece. Right. <laughs> because you want it to succeed. That's the whole point. Is And, oh, did you notice, too, recently I posted a, um, a newspaper article that I dug out from for Boot Hill. And it said, the Trinity boys are back. But Boot Hill came out in 69, and this came out in 70. <laughs> so this had been released here before Boot Hill was, cause, because it was just such a big hit. Right. Yeah, it, it's it's funny when you when you start talking about, like, uh, you know, international distribution. Like, you know, you're going to get some things before you get other things. And, you know, it's like, oh, you know, let me, uh, let me use this as a promotion for that, because this is what people are going to be familiar with, as opposed to... You know, this, this, even though this one just came out, you know, we're going to reference something that, you know, has been out for years the other way. Right. Well, and especially, you know, all right, so Boot Hill didn't do that well, but then this one is a huge hit. Let's dust off Boot Hill because there was no such thing as, you know, on demand or videotape or anything. So let's dust it out and put it out again and, and you know, show people, hey, look at the Trinity boys are back. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's... uh it's like, yeah, this movie came out a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's 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 weird the way they had to kind of market it. But yeah. I mean, do what you got to do. You know, it's like those people that use the uh you know, like the 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 random quotes on movies where it's like, "Oh, you know, like this was way better." And then it's like an ellipses, it's like dot dot dot. Then I could have hoped for, you know, and it's like right. you find out the full quote is like this was even better than, you know, you know, being eaten alive by, you know, rabid badgers, which is the best death, <laughs> best death I could have hoped for, you know, like, so it's, <laughs> yes, technically they said those words, but there was some other stuff in between. In between, right? <laughs> but yeah, there's, That's there's, uh, you know, marketing is a weird, a weird thing. You know, it's right. like, yeah, I would rather get punched in the face 40 times than see this movie more than once. And then people are like, <laughs> see this movie more than once. <laughs> like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, it's like, oh, yeah, there's funny. the quote. So if you're ever giving a, a, a review of something, you know, make sure that your sentence is very clear and can't be... <laughs> right. It's very tight. It's like, I didn't like this movie. And then it's just like, I... Dot, 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 like this movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Why is there why is that? Oh, it's unrelated. What do you mean it's unrelated? That's funny. You know what's um interesting too is you had referenced earlier uh the the fact that sort of these kind of movies gave way to the buddy action cop movies of the eighties and nineties. And uh, Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer did uh, quite a few buddy cop movies in the 80s, maybe even into the 90s. So I think, uh, Patsy, you and I talked off um, off mic about maybe doing specials down the road where we cover some of these actors that, in other movies that they were in. 
and uh, I think it would be fun. That just every time I'm doing research now, like especially in this movie, I kept coming across these other movies that they made, and I'm like, ooh, I want to see that. Ooh, I want to see that. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's um, you know, it's again like you know we were talking about with cameos and stuff for the last film. You know, it's it's always nice to see actors that you like. It's like, oh, that's a guy from the thing. You know, every time you know. right. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, I I, yeah. I I think that's a good idea. You know, give uh, kind of show that these guys aren't just one trick ponies. Right. Exactly. So moving on, we've got Stefan Zacharias who played Jonathan, who I thought was a hilarious character. He was the guy that was sort of the caretaker of the sheriff's office, and you know, he was very con- he was dirty, but he was very concerned about cleanliness, constantly knocking uh, uh, Trinity's feet off of the sheriff's desk. And, you know, taking care of the prisoners and stuff. Um, he was in Man of La Mancha. But most people, I think, listening to this show might remember him as the prisoner in the movie Ice Pirates. He was also in The Frisco Kid with Gene Wilder, which I did see in the theaters, although I don't really remember it all that much. That was a Western. And um, he was in the exploitation exploitation sequel, Exterminator 2, uh, another movie that I saw in the theater because my parents and I liked the first one so much we went and saw the second one. So, uh, what'd you think of his character? I, uh, I, I liked pretty much all of the characters in this, all of this, all of this, um, hold on, like, sorry, I'm still, like, I, I explained to you off, off air earlier, I still have, you know, vaccine brain sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I enjoyed all of the characters from this. There wasn't anybody that I was like, oh my God, I hate this guy. I hope he gets shot in the face. You know, like... Everybody served their purpose and served it served it well. Like I understand, like even like the the head of the Mormons there, you know his whole his whole thing is like, well, you know we're gonna stick by our religious beliefs. It's like, yeah, but like these guys come in and like they trash everything, they wreck your your barn and they smack you around, and it's like, you know, like the uh, yeah the Mexican guy kept coming in and like a uh, mezcal they called him. He kept coming right. in and like slapping people and it's like ah turn the other cheek turn the other cheek and then he'd slap them again like you know it's like oh like so there were there were definitely <laughs> characters you didn't like you know but it's not because but you were supposed to not like them right it's not because the actor was terrible or like you know right it was just you know executed poorly like this was done well like these guys did a good job uh portraying their characters oh yeah well, I even like the characters of Weasel and Timid that showed up finally. They were uh, Bambino's buddies there. Yeah, they they definitely played their role well. And you know, for bit parts, you know, they played they played what they were supposed to do, and they did it. I think the way they were supposed to do it. So they were like NPCs called in at the last minute to help out. <laughs> yeah, like you know, almost like the uh, the guys that always uh, end up coming in to give exposition and then leave in all the Shaw Brothers films. Right. <laughs> Unless they're dying. Yes. Like it's like, oh, I, I'll I'll make I'll make it through. I, everything will be fine. Oh, I'm dead. Yeah. Um we get this guy, Michelle Chimarosa, who played the drunken Mexican, and his character I thought was hilarious. I think that could easily have been a really annoying character. But I just thought it was funny, and they did, never knew what to do with him. Well, what do we do with him? Ah, just get him drunk and make him pass out. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's uh, the best way to. Uh, I think that's the best way to do it. You know, make sure he stays out of uh, stays out of uh, out of their way. Because he almost at one point when the real sheriff showed up and he had the photo or the uh, the wanted posters of uh, Bambino and, and Timid and Weasel. He was almost going to say something because he looked at them and he started to. And then Jonathan grabs him and goes, yeah, yeah, okay, let's go. And <laughs> takes him out. And that's why he took him with him to the uh, to the Mormon ranch. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought that was, uh, that, was <laughs> that was one of the better parts of the film. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. Like, I had a lot of fun. I, I was like, all right, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely keeping my interest in focused on this movie because it's you know it's well done i was kind of looking forward to this one a little more like i got to see a little bit of uh the beginning last night but like i was having a hard time like staying awake (laughs) because of right you know everything that's going on but uh yeah like this 
it's so much fun. And like, it just, he, Terrence Hill just plays this character like with such nonchalance. I love it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you, Oh, actually you did notice because you and I texted each other, uh, last night about this, the song, the theme song, Trinity Titoli was later used in as the closing theme for Quentin Tarantino's Western, uh, Django and change. Yeah. In 2012. And boy, did they use it like <laughs> they used yeah. it all the time. <laughs> Like it was pretty much the only music. Yeah, yeah. It's it just over and over and and over and over. <laughs> this movie, the, um, it uh, it did so well at the box office. It was, I think, second to for a few dollars more. The uh, Sergio Leone Clint Eastwood movie, which I still haven't seen. No, nope, we will get to those. We are going to get to the um, the Leone films. I think we're, I want to save those for like when we have an anniversary, like a twenty fifth, fiftieth episode kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, this um, like I said, this thing created its own subgenre. It spawned an entire army of false sequels, loose sequels, pale imitations, and then some good sequels as well. Um, this and then of course the, they were referred to as, as we said before, the Fajoli westerns, like Pasta Fajol. And um, but that that end fight. Another one, like the last movie, to, uh, uh, almost 20 minutes, and apparently it's one of the most elaborate fist fights ever put on film. Yeah, it was really good. Man, I just loved it. I was I was thinking about that. And I was like, man, the the choreography for this is like rivaling some of the uh some of the uh, Shaw Brothers films. And of course, we have to have the obligatory, you know, uh Terrence Hill swinging on something showing off his uh acrobatic <laughs> skills. Oh yeah. I mean, he was doing things like what? He he'd run past two guys, jump on the table, do a handspring, and kick them in the face with his feet, and then flip over and you know kick another guy. It was so good. Plus, you know, like I said, the uh, the the swinging from like that support beam, swinging back and forth, because that's just yeah. what he does. <laughs> like he yeah. does that in every movie almost. He definitely did it in right. Ace High, climbing up shit, and like it was yeah, it was uh, it was fun. Like it's oh yeah, I I definitely really enjoyed this one, and um, you know I can't wait to see the next one because uh, we have the 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 sequel coming up. Obviously the um, yep. What's his name there? Yep. My name is my. They still call me Trinity, or my name is. They still call me Trinity. Make sure um yeah. <laughs> when you call me, make sure you still call me Trinity. Just don't call me late for dinner. Right. Like I don't know. Right. <laughs> One other thing I want to mention, I loved when, like I had said before, all the little, if you got to really pay attention to the little dialogue in the background. And every time the sheriff, uh, yeah, every time Bambino's walking down the street and someone walks past him and they're like, hey, sheriff. And he's like, shut up. <laughs> yeah. Every single time. <laughs> Which is great because, like, it definitely gives you that, uh, that you know, he's gruff, but. I almost want to call him like a gruff but lovable, because like right. that's kind of how he's how he's how he's portraying himself. Yeah, he's just so surly, but it, his surly reactions were were hilarious. Oh yeah, he's he's great. He's you know for a guy that doesn't have a lot to do, you know what I mean? Like he they don't give him a lot. Like he sure is able to get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, range. Oh yeah, but he does your your favorite scene. He does your favorite move, the um, the Hulk. Oh yeah, take on twenty five guys at once. Yeah, <laughs> that was so awesome. And you just saw that coming, and like it was just so cool. I was wondering what he was gonna like. I honestly was waiting for him to pick them all up. Right. <laughs> like, is he gonna carry them? Like, what are we doing here? Well, there's that one shot where Trinity calls to him in the middle of the final battle, and he's standing there holding a guy by his belt buckle in his right hand like it was nothing. And he's like, huh? Oh, and he drops the guy on the ground and goes off to whatever Trinity needed. Yeah, because he's just awesome. Like, Yeah. Yeah, I, I really liked this one. Uh, this one was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would definitely highly recommend this to anybody. Like even if you're just starting, yeah. uh, starting out getting into westerns, you know maybe start with this one. Although this does set the bar fairly high. It does, it does. You know you could almost start with uh, with uh, what was the second Giuliano Gemma film that we saw? Oh, uh, Return of Ringo. Yeah, I was gonna say the Ringo. Because they movies. only get better from there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 
you know, if you're going to watch the two Ringo films back to back, you got to remember that they are uh, all the same actors, but none of the same characters, except for Ringo. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, so this was good, and this was cool and refreshing, almost like a beverage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was one of those movies when I watched it, and I knew I was going to watch it again. I couldn't wait to watch it again. I, if I had time when I did watch it, I would have turned around and, you know, just started it over from the beginning because there's just so much to it. I mean, you and I couldn't even cover. If we were to cover every single joke and detail in the movie, it's like you might as well just watch the film. That's how good it was. Yes, yeah, yeah, like there's there's a lot of really excellent humor there's a lot of really excellent sight gags, you know, like you're saying with the, uh, you know, him just hanging on to the guy during like the big fight at the end. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Right. It's it's just so good. Yeah. So all right. So I take that your your final uh, recommendation is that people should see this one, right? Yeah, absolutely. This one uh, is excellent, and I think anytime these two guys pair up, uh, it's worth watching. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree. And I think this is on Amazon right now. You probably got to pay a couple bucks for it, but it's well worth it. It's just such a fun movie. There is a DVD double set out there, which I don't think is too expensive. I think it's like 25 bucks or something. But yeah, I will, um, I'm will. i going to post the link for the Shaw Brothers film DVD, where I got that from. Uh, by the way, folks, we are in no way affiliated with the company that we got the DVD from. But I just want to put it out there. So if you're, you know, listening to the show and you want to see these movies, there is a place where you can get them from. Um, so that was our review today of Heaven and Hell. And uh, my name is Trinity. And our next film, I believe, is going to be the two champions of Shaolin for the Shaw Brothers. And uh, they, uh, my name is, they still call me my name is Trinity or? Uh... Yeah, my name is still <laughs> You can call me Trinity, but just don't call me late for dinner. Right. And this is the Trinity films. It's like, um, how do I describe it? There are, I think we've mentioned before, at least I've mentioned to you, Pat, that there are, um, like, for example, there's a 26 Django movies, but only one is the true sequel to the original, and that was made like 20 years later. There's a, a zillion S Z Sabata films. There's a zillion um, Ringo films. And I think there's a whole bunch of Trinity films, too, and they're just not related to this one. Um, so there's only just the one true sequel, and then, you know, down the road, we'll we'll come back to these. Um, for now, we'll just stick with these two. And, and I think the one we're going to do after the, the, the second Trinity film is going to be called My Name is Nobody, which is um, Terrence Hill and Henry Fonda. Bud Spencer is not in that one, but I've heard very good things about it. So oh, I'm looking forward to that one, then. Yeah. So, uh, Patsy, why don't you uh, tell the good folks where they can find you online? Uh, best places to find me, uh, if you go to uh, Facebook, we have the uh, Throwdown Thursday Facebook group, the Loudest Sports Show uh, Facebook group, uh, where I also raffle off uh, sports memorabilia. Uh, we did, uh, last week, we did uh, an O.J. Simpson. We've got some Magic Johnson stuff coming up, like not your typical Magic Johnson stuff either, like... I have a couple of mini football helmets autographed by Magic Johnson coming in, which is, uh, like I said, not your typical stuff. So, uh, um, <laughs> you know, I try to find some unique things. Uh, but that's also a podcast that you can find every Friday on Spotify. Throw it on Thursday, obviously, uh, as uh, Rigor mentioned, uh, we just celebrated our 250th episode. That's also on Spotify um, and YouTube. Uh, we have the YouTube channel, um, Throw Down Thursday podcast, and all of our all of our stuff is uh, kind of under that umbrella. So you'll find, you know, some clips from games. You know, when I find weird stuff in games, I'll I'll kind of post that. You know, ten fifteen second clips, and uh, you know, live episodes of uh, the Loudest Sports Show, uh, live episodes of um, Throw Down Thursday, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much the best place oh you can also find me on amazon uh, i wrote a book called how much do you tip an exorcist you can check that out it's uh, only 10 bucks oh. for 10 bucks you can find out how much you're supposed to tip an exorcist that's awesome oh man definitely i gotta have you on then is now so we can talk about that i'll have to buy the book and read it first and then um and then we'll talk about it oh i i, I think it's a it's a fun little read it's um there's a lot of it's uh there's a lot of uh really Excellent drawings by my friend Jeanette Andromeda, who is a supremely talented artist. I did a lot of two-sentence stories and horror haikus, and then there's ten short stories. And there's some, 
you know, some filler material in there, like, you know, terrible superpowers and movies that I'd like to see the <laughs> asylum make. Nice. Yeah, you know, just just uh, just a bunch of fun stuff like that. Awesome. Awesome, dude. Well, obviously, thanks once again for being my co-host here on the East Meets the West. And, folks, don't forget that the East Meets the West is part of the Dorkening Podcast Network. So please check us out there and check out all the other great shows at thedorkening.com. You can send us your thoughts on today's episode to the East Meets the West 42 at gmail.com. And uh, check out our website at havenpodcasts.com, where you can also find our sister show, Then Is Now, where we discuss all the cool stuff that you may have missed out on and stuff that you should know. And please, please go wherever you download your podcast from and leave us a great review if you like the show so that more people can find the show. And you can check out our East Meets the West uh, YouTube page at youtube.com slash user slash Uncle Death One, which is where you'll find that and all our podcasts as well as other fun stuff. And uh, make sure when you go to YouTube to hit this, not only hit the subscribe button, but also share it with your friends and get them to subscribe as well. That is all the time we have today. Join us again on our next episode of The East Meets the West. The West is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. All clips played on the show are property of their copyright holders. All other material is copyright Jupiter Media. shows like the one you just heard check out the dorkening podcast network at the dorkening.com